Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess Videos. I'm your host, the Backyard Professor. And these videos are going to show us a Bobby Fischer chess game that is really kind of nice. Fischer is playing, he's the, oh, and I forgot to rearrange it, dang it. Fischer's the white. We'll just play it. No, I can't play it this way because the number is backward. Oh, for stupider and dumb. Anyway, let me explain real quick, and I'll switch this. Boy, that's a typical. I have been bipped. The new deal on our chess club now is uh, if I beat you in a game or if I show a real good tactic, you've been bipped. B-Y-P-E-D, but it's pronounced bipped. So you've been bipped. I bipped myself here. Anyway, Maurice Fox, Fisher's opponent, was an eight time Canadian champion, a very strong master, and we're going to watch Fisher take on one of the tough guys. Hang on, and I'll change this board out, and I'll be right back. Holy shish kebab, kawa stinking bunga Batman throwing lemons at him. Boosh. Hold on. Okay, so Fisher's playing the white, and Fox is playing the black pieces. And, uh, by the way, just so you know, yeah, baby, I'm still fat, man, but I've lost two more pounds. Yeah, yeah, this is happening. We're going to make this goal. You hear me? You hear me? Yes, you hear me. Okay, knight f3, knight f6, g3, d6, bishop g2, g6, Fisher will castle real early, and then bishop g7. So, this is the fee and kettle of the bishops in the King's Indian, I believe he said he was going to play. I think the book said King's Indian. Anyway, doesn't matter. I've got to learn my openings, that's the way it is. And now, Fisher goes d3. Notice he's, he's starting... Slow in the center. This is good, right? And then his opponent, Fox, will outfox him and castle. E4, this is very popular for Fisher to do. He bumps one, and then he bumps the next one, two, and the E5, so they meet in the center. So you can see very symmetrical. And remember, symmetry, if you're going to do a symmetrical opening, be really careful if you're playing black, because symmetry favors white, just so you know, right? So, knight b2, d2, and now c6, and c3. Fisher, Fisher is preparing with this c3 push to push the pawn to d4. It is why he put the knight at d2 instead of c3. Can you see that? Because from d2, he can support this pawn and this square. And this, with this knight, I mean, he's going to support this. This knight supports this pawn. God, I said that backwards. Don't listen to what I say. Listen to what I mean. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, okay. No, seriously. Queen c7, knight to h4, he's immediately looking for a stakeout claim, although he doesn't have an outpost yet, so what's he doing? Let's watch. Knight h4, and now a5, he's starting on the queen side, Fisher will push, whoops, not c, Fisher will push f4 instantly, so... I mean, against Ben Feingold's common wisdom today, you don't push the F-pawn. Fisher did push the F-pawn. This is part of his opening repertoire for this game. He's hitting the center from the king's side. It will enable him to have an open file. And open files are almost important. As those of you who keep drumming me in our chess games with open files can demonstrate they even work again. I get bipped all the time from you guys, man. That's going to be my new thing. I'm going to bip ya, baby. <laughs> Let's bip the BYP. Yeah, whatever. You bit me too much already. You guys are savages, I'm telling you.
savages. Now, knight b to d7. So, let's look at this. Fisher pushing his knight on the h4 took off a little bit of pressure on this pawn. And Fox, by putting his knight here, gave it a little bit more support. Right? I'm just pointing that out. And now Fisher goes f5. He's, look how fast. Now, they both being kettled, so the g pawn is sticking out. But look how fast Fisher is to get that f pawn up there to hit that king side to try to crack it open. That's a pretty quick pawn movement, right? He's not real well developed yet, but he's already trying to shatter the, queen, or the king side uh, pawn structure. That's really... Very interesting. Knight c5, a great spot for the knight. Fisher puts his knight on b3, and now the knight will exchange on d3. And a will take b3. Now, taken with the a pawn, opens up the a file for the rook. Although at this point, he can't use it a lot. I'm just letting you be aware there's an open file here, right? And now, knight bumps down to d7. Again, Fox is supporting the e5 pawn, right? So let's see what Fisher does. g4. He is pushing a pawn storm on the king side, isn't he? It's real interesting to see how early in the game Fisher is pushing so many pawns on this. Rook e8. Queen f3. So Fisher really does look committed to a king side here. Knight again c5. Now, he exchanged Fisher's knight on this side, and now he is putting his knight back on c5. So Fox is keeping an eye. He's keeping the queen side under control of Bobby Fisher on the queen side, while Fisher is committing to the king side. So this could be quite a screaming game, right? You see that? And now, f6. And uh, there's a question mark here. He's a little bit youthfully gung-ho with this pawn push. <laughs> it's, it's a good pawn push, but the comment in the book is the prophylactic rook a3 would have been a better move, right? That's what the uh, note said. But he didn't. He went ahead and pushed the f-pawn really hard. And knight... Oh no, bishop goes to f8. So he bumps his bishop back down. Now, true, he got the bishop off the g-square. That doesn't mean the bishop is still not a good guardian of the king side. Uh, it is, the king is fine. This is not a crisis for um, Fox in any way. And now knight f5. Fisher is adamant about breaking open that king side. He's even willing to sacrifice a knight to do it, right? Kind of interesting. Fox ignores Fisher's emphasis on the king side. And he pushes that D pawn. Center. Fisher has been playing on the king's side. Yeah. Fox is properly responding with central influence. Central movement and central play. Yeah. The D5 pawn. Very interesting here. Queen comes to G3. D will take E4. Again, Fox is functioning in the center, which is usually uh, how you want to play against a wing attack. Fox is doing it very, very well. And then D takes E4. Aha! An open file. Right down the heart of the chessboard. So, this is going to be really interesting to see what happens. King comes to H8. Queen comes to H4. He's gently uh, moving the mass up the king side. Right? And in the meantime... Notice the counterbalance, as it were, of Fox in the center, right? 
and that open files waiting for them to either fight over or one of them to possess. So this game is getting tough, right? Queen comes to d8. True, it's a queen. It doesn't belong on the open file as such, but there it is. And now, yeah, knight g7, there's another question mark here. Uh, as Selman has said, the best, the ideal row for knights is going to be the sixth row. Yeah. Um, you have diminishing power in the seventh and the eighth. Uh, it's, I mean, it's true. Target is the rook here, but that is not the best place for the knight. Not, not with this setup at this point. So that's kind of something... Uh, more interesting, the comment also is, and I've noticed that when I'm playing you guys online and when you're playing me online, uh, we have a tendency to do a one or a two uh, piece attack and maneuvering. And the comment here is, the other defect of this move is Bishop E3 would have been better. Getting the entire army into this. Yeah, because you're hitting the knight for one thing, right? There's a target. Yeah. Instead of, see, Fisher has had a lot of pawn moves up the F-file and a lot of knight moves to get his knight in that position. So he's still not fully mobile. He's got his rook here that hasn't moved and his bishop. It would be better had he been doing that. That's the comment. That's the idea. So the bishop takes g7. He's not going to let that impudent knight just sit there looking glorious. No, he's going to take him. And f takes g7, check. And king comes to g8. So you can see the queen hoping to breathe fire down here. And this, this bishop, although the bishop, the bad bishop is hitting granite here at this point. You can see that. So the Fisher, the fish, yeah, the Fisher Bishop can't really get into this attack yet, and he hasn't brought in the rest of his army. So it's kind of a defective opening strategy for Bobby here. And remember, he's still really, really young. During this is still 1956, I believe he was 13. So I mean, we're talking a young Bobby Fisher. So he does bump back down to F2 with the rook on the open file with behind the queen now he's got a great target but fox isn't going to let him have that i mean it's a great setup but there's ways to prevent this and fox will show us how queen e7 and notice fox also has the rook queen battery even though the center pawns are there yeah so uh bishop g5 Target, hitting the target of the queen, right? And now, knight comes to d3. Notice how fox is not reacting to every threat Bobby gives him. Uh, instead, he is still maintaining the initiative in the center. It's real interesting to see that. Again, an attack in the center when Bobby's going to the king side. I'm going to emphasize that because that's how this guy played Bobby Fisher. Fisher later became a master of that technique as well, without question. Strike in the center. That is the key, right? Well, queen d2, and queen comes to d7, and now... Uh, real interesting. Now, I have said in many of my videos, rooks on open files, rook A to D1, but there's a question mark here. The comment is interesting. Notice that this is the third question mark within 26 moves in Bobby Fisher's game. Here's the comment. It would have been better just to protect the cockeyed g pawn. I mean, it's being hit. Uh, protect it. Bobby's trying too hard, not, not necessarily to get fancy, but he's trying a little bit too hard. 
So, uh, queen takes g4. This is what Bobby could have prevented. And now, now, interesting, look how the, uh, the flip has occurred. Bobby has been... You get the impression he's somewhat struggling to get a kingside going. And all of a sudden, blam, pulled out of the blue. Here comes Fox's queen, striking. And, and Bobby's king is much looser because he was pushing that f-pawn so hard than Fox's king. The, Fox's king is not in any kind of danger whatsoever. Bobby has to pay attention now. Very interesting how that works, huh? So, uh, where is my bishop to h6? And knight to f4. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that knight move. What an outpost, yeah. That is a permanent knight outpost. Right in the heart of Bobby Sanders' king side. I mean, who's getting the attack here, right? This is pretty impressive. That's not bad. Queen and the knight now. And the bishop is coming into this angle also. And the rook, even though these pawns are blocked at this point, but that can change through the course of the game. So I just want you to pay attention to that, just to be aware of that. Well, Bobby is virtually forced to exchange that knight. I said it was a permanent outpost. No pawns could chase the knight off. In a permanent outpost, you have to exchange the knight if you're going to get rid of it. Yeah. And now E takes F4, and now what a wickedly delightful pass pawn Fox has. And I, I'm here to tell you, this last week I played a few games of chess with you guys, and for whatever reason, my game, I am really fighting against pass pawns. I have to learn how to correct that. You guys get pass pawns on me way too easy, and I'm going to correct that. Yeah, yeah, I promise. No, I'm not kidding. So, uh, where are we? Bishop takes it. Okay, now the rook will take that passed pawn. That passed pawn is so powerful, Bobby Fisher takes it with the rook. Just realize that. Queen to h5. He also hits the queen target. Does it get rid of her? No, no. The queen's there. Just bump over to h5, and you've still got lanes into Bobby's king. Real good, right? Rook d to f1. Now the doubling of the rooks. Now, here it's looking like Bobby is picking up the steam, right? It looks like he is getting some momentum and initiative. who among us wouldn't love to have rook, doubled up rooks on the F-file when the opponent has castled kingside. Yeah. Right? Bishop E6. Just that quick. Not only developing a piece, but completely protecting the kingside. And controlling even more of the center. I mean, when you play good, you play good, right? Queen comes over to F2. Now, it looks like Bobby's going to run right up the F-file. Here we go. We are going to fight regardless. And then Rook E7. End of argument. Just two quick moves, man. And Fox shuts Fisher down against the king side. That is remarkable. Just want you to see that. Very interesting. So Bobby comes up to c4, and the queen will come over to e5, and the rook will go to f6. Now this move is, uh, in modern nomenclature, called Alakin's block. The principal idea here is to prevent black from pushing the f-pawn in a manner of defending. 
Now, of course, everything Bobby has that's huge and powerful is on that F file. So it's inevitable Black is going to be forced to push that F pawn. Before he can do that, Bobby blocks the F pawn. That's a great tactic. Yeah? Very cool. It's at this point that Fox takes the pawn that was on G7 and Bobby pushes the H pawn. See, he's throwing all of his pawns up there. This is a full scale pawn piece attack by Bobby, but he just doesn't seem effective. And look at this. Look how Fox shuts down that F file against Fisher. Fabulous. Either a bishop sacrifice or just flat out cutting off the rook from the rest of the, the file. Bobby is in kind of hot water here. This is a tough go. The rook takes f5, so he actually ends up losing the exchange, and g takes f5, and you say, yeah, but uh, the king side is being broken open. Fox's king side is being broken open. Let's see what happens. e takes f, going to push another pawn. He's got the h and the f pawns to push, if he so desires. Blam, F6. Thunk, stops it. No pawn advance, but he does control the G6 square. Kind of. It's contested with the H pawn. He's got an open file, it's true, but the queen here is covering this diagonal, so Bobby can't get to the king to attack it. Drats, right? That dirty rat! You guys are having entirely too much fun with that, by the way. I'm just letting you know. So, Bobby goes king h1. And queen e3. Power move. Open file, man. What can you say? The e file is blacks. Yeah. Notice that uh, for all of the attempt... For the energy that Bobby has been putting into a kingside attack, Fox has always been responding in the center. And that is proper. That is one of the reasons why he keeps thwarting Fisher's kingside attack. One, he's trading off pieces, but two, he is always responding in the center. That's important to know. Bobby learned this in his later games. He never failed to do this. So, and we'll, and we'll see those. So this is uh, this is tough. This is getting good. Oh, I hope I didn't lose my place for the love of Sam Walton. King h1. Queen e3. Yeah, queen e3 right there. Now, queen to c2. Isn't it remarkable that... Fisher did not feel comfortable swapping queens, but Fox did. Just something to be aware of. Bobby also turned that around in his later games, too, without question. So, we really have a battle here. And now, rook d8. Why not? You've got an e-file rook holding the e-file. Great! You've got a d-file open. Go grab it with your other rook. That is tough chess. That is tough chess. Like it. Like it. Yes, very strong response. Rook f3, okay. Bobby's not without resources. Target. Targeting the queen, right? Queen e1, check. Who got to whose king first? And where did the attack come from? Fox got to Fisher right through the center on open files with the rooks and the queen. That should turn on a light bulb for you. Yeah. And Fox's king is somewhat loose. I mean, it's not like he is completely protected under cover, is he? Very interesting to see this. Really kind of interesting. King h2, I mean, it's not like his king is in, in real bad danger, but the point is that Fox 
Rook on open file, using the open file, coming to d2, hitting the target of Fisher's queen. Man! Right through the center. Very, very nice to see. Very good. Well, queen c3. Pin the rook to the queen. Yeah, teach him. Right? Queen takes h4, check. Who's the first one to get to the king's side and obliterate it? Fox. How is he getting to the king's side? Through the center. That's powerful. That, that's just really powerful. Really, truly. Rook h3. Nice block. Good attack. Good defense. Rook takes g2 check. Cowabunga, baby, when you're playing good, powerful chess. Not only does he dominate the central files with the rooks, he gets to the seventh rank, oh, and he goes over to Fisher, and he dominates Fisher on the seventh rank, too. Eliminating the defenders and Fisher's cover. This is what we, we as chess players can gain from this game. Painful as it is to watch, the young Bobby Fisher is being shown what uh, attack chess is. Yeah. And now, other... Look, the rook on the d-file did enough damage smacking that bishop out, right? Now the rook on the e-file comes in to go check. And you've got the queen over here on the h-file. That is being threatened, and you notice Fox again... Having the initiative does not react to Bobby's threats. He is maintaining the pressure. He is maintaining the use of the open files with the rooks down to the seventh rank and hitting his king. That is tough chess. That is how to play tough chess. Very, very interesting to watch. Bobby's in trouble. King G1. A uh, queen e1 check. Now, there's actually a question mark here. And what he should have done was queen to f2, huh? He came all the way down to e1, but f2 was much stronger because king goes to h1, and then he goes to g2 checkmate. So, <laughs> the eight-time Canadian champion missed a checkmate. That makes some of us lesser mortals feel just a little bit better, right? I have taken my lumps for missing checkmates in tactics. So here we have a beautiful example of this happening as well. Instead, he went for the exchange of queens, but he is in a position to do so for this reason. And then I believe the rook takes e1. Again, check. And... King comes to f2, and rook over to b1. The pawn structure is better for fox. The number of pawns is better for fox, right? Uh, this endgame with the rooks and pawns, as a general rule, rook and pawn endgames end up as a draw. Let's watch an instructive endgame. King to e3. Fisher comes charging. Rook takes b2. Undoubles Fisher's pawns, even though Fisher probably didn't want to. King d4. Now look at the activation of the king here. This is really good on Fisher's part. Uh, b6. Notice how putting the pawns across from each other eliminates any weaknesses of holes. Now every square in front of those pawns is covered, so the king cannot keep advancing to take those pawns, because Fisher's pawn is just a little further than these two. And this one's not going to make it because of this one, right? Very instructive. And now he comes to king c3, and again, a question mark. Uh, rook g3 check was the move. He needs to regain the initiative. 
push the king away. Uh, and now, rook f2, and rook comes to h5. Fisher is still targeting, hoping for a miracle on the king side, right? Not going to happen. Rook f3, check. King bumps down here to b2, and now rook g3, covering the file that his king is on, which gives black plenty of protection, right? So this is a tough lesson. Uh, Bobby comes back down to h2 with his rook, and now rook g5, he's going to, he's not only going to maintain that column in front of his king to keep his king protected, he's going to attack Bobby's pawn. He's going to make sure that pawn doesn't get in, right? That's what he's doing. Well, Bobby says nothing doing. I've got the rook behind the pawn, which is the proper placement of rooks, right? And king f7, he's going to bump out of the way out of danger. And now king comes back over to c3, and king to e7, and rook to e2, and king to d7, and rook to d2, and king to c7. So he's made it over to his majority pawns on this side. But notice that his rook controls the pawns over on the king's side. This is a one game for him. Bobby comes back to rook f2, and then king d6, and king d4, the king's meet in opposition here. And now rook g4 check to Bobby's king. He bumps down to d3. And now king comes to e5. That's where they're going to get that pawn out of there. The f pawn will fall now. Rook h2. Rook to g7. He doesn't have to attack anymore. Rook to h6. Bobby is trying so hard to get something going on the king's side. And now king takes the pawn. King takes f5. Yeah, the pawn falls. And now that gives black two pass pawns on that king side. And it was here that Fisher resigned. So a tough game against an exquisitely tough opponent, without question. So what can we learn from this game I think the two most important salient features of this chess game of Fisher is, number one, every time he attempted a kingside thrust in his attack, he was refuted with central attack by Fox. Fox always went to the center of Bobby Fisher, in the, in the uh, center of the board, and that stymied his kingside power in his attack. The second most salient feature of this incredibly interesting game was the exquisite power of those rooks on the open file and putting those rooks down onto the seventh rank so that the seventh rank was completely dominated. And it just knocked Fisher back on his heels. There was an anything he could do about it to prevent any of that. So those two features in this wonderful game of an early Bobby Fisher are very valuable for us in our chess games. That's what I wanted to get across. So thanks for watching my Backyard Professor videos. Remember, be good, do well, have fun. Thanks, work hard, make boatloads of money, and if you don't be happy with what you're doing, we can live within our means. And remember, I'm doing what I call intermittent fasting. That is, I'll eat my last meal I'm eating during the day is lunch. I haven't had anything since noon. That means from noon all the way around the clock to noon. I don't eat because I don't eat breakfast. Yes, I know, I'm not going to maintain this, but in order to bump down fairly fast, not only am I exercising, but I am also doing a really good diet 
of intermittent fasting without all the snacks. Now that's my way. I'm not giving you any medical advice. You do what works for you because every body is different, right? So just because someone is successful in one area doesn't mean that's for everybody. No, I'm not giving you any medical advice. Forget about it. I'm the backyard professor. I ain't the backyard doc. However, remember, mind, body, spirit, chess for our minds. That's one feature. Also, reading many good books. Yeah. Chess for our mind. Exercise and diet for our body. And kindness to everyone for our spirit. I'm telling you, we can do this, man. We can make a difference in the world. I believe that. Even though it's only just me. Right? All right, thanks. That's enough blabbing, man. Shut up and turn the video off, dude. Hey, I will see you guys in the next Backyard Professor Chess video.